Well, the summer and autumn months are a wonderful time to target Jewfish in Sydney Harbour. And over the years, I've had lots and lots of requests for episodes on that very topic. And I've published a number of episodes on that topic, including the one that I'm reposting today with Cam Cronin. Now, Cam's a bit of an icon when it comes to catching Jewfish on lures in the Sydney area, and particularly within Sydney Harbour. And he doesn't hold back on sharing any tips in this interview. And that's why I've reposted it, because there's just so much gold in there for anybody wanting to learn how to catch Jewfish in the Sydney area. So if you haven't heard this interview with Cam, then you are in for a treat. If you have heard it before, then please uh, listen again. I'm sure you'll pick up tips that you missed the first time around because I know that I definitely did. And one more thing, folks, the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast has published over 650 episodes at the time of publishing this repost, and they're all packed with great information to help you catch more fish on lures wherever you are in Australia, whatever species you like to target. But obviously, to produce content of that nature and that quality and so much information that can help people to catch more fish takes time and it costs money. So, so that's why we created the Team Doc Lures community. So the Team Doc Lures community is for those who want even a little bit more than what you get in the regular podcast. So things like some pro-level tips and audio masterclasses and ebooks and online tools that you can use and tackle deals as well. So that's all over in Team Doc Lures. But the other reason we created the community is that it helps to keep the podcast on the air. It helps us to continue to produce new episodes each week and publish them for everybody to enjoy. So if you're already a member of Team Doc Lures, then I really want to thank you for supporting the podcast and helping us to do that. If you're not a member, I'd like to encourage you to consider becoming a member. The cost is around about the same as what you'd pay for a pint down at your local once a month. So it's pretty cheap. But when you drink that pint, it's gone. When you have a membership with Team Doc Lures, you get the opportunity to access knowledge and to improve your fishing for the rest of your life. So it's a really good investment. Check it out over at Team Doc Lures. That's team, T-E-A-M dot doclures.com, T-E-A-M dot doclures.com. Sign up today, get the members content, get access to the tackle deals, get the live streams and the online resources and help us to keep the podcast on air. And with that, folks, I'm now going to hand you over to this repost of Cam Cronin's interview on Fishing for Jewfish in Sydney Harbour. This is the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast, where we share the secrets of Australia's lure fishing gurus every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And now he's your host, Greg Vinyl from DocLures.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 322 of the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. I'm Greg DocLures Vinyl, great to have you here for today's show. My job is to bring you some of Australia's best and brightest lure fishers and have them share a few tips, tricks and secrets that will help you and I to improve our lure fishing out of sight. And today's guest, if you're keen on the Jewfish and if you live in the central part of New South Wales coast around the Sydney area, today's episode is going to be absolute gold for you because he's somebody who specialises in Jewfish. He's obsessed with Jewfish. And I tell you what, it's a longer episode than usual because he had a lot of great stuff to share. So I'm going to bring Cam to the microphone in just a minute. Before I do, for those who are members of Team Doc Lures, just a reminder that we've put up a new audio masterclass with John Hankey, all about the five top lures for fishing in central Queensland. So these are the five lures that John reckons will catch fish anytime, any place in central Queensland. In fact, John reckons this particular selection will serve you well anywhere you go in northern Australia. And I tell you what, I tend to agree. Now, of course, John hasn't just given us a list of lures. He's talked through how to fish each one, where to fish each one, what species to target with each lure, and everything else you need to know to be able to use those lures to great effect. So it was a near hour-long conversation. The whole thing is edited, uploaded to Team Doc Lures. If you're not a member of Team Doc Lures and you're interested in listening to this podcast episode, the answer's simple, become a member. Go and check it out at team.doclures.com. That's T-E-A-M dot doclures.com. It costs very, very little to join. I'm keeping the cost down to make it as accessible as I can to everybody. But every cent that goes into that helps support the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast, helps to keep us on air, helps us to put together some great guests and some great masterclasses like the one with John. And rest assured that the next masterclass is already being scheduled and recorded 
and will be just as good, but on a slightly different focus. So stay tuned to see what that one's all about. Of course, we'll announce it on the show. We'll also put some stuff up on Facebook when it becomes available. So that's team.doclaws.com. Go and check it out. But for now, folks, it's time we get today's free episode of the podcast up and running. So let's get Cam Cranon to the microphone and let's talk Sydney Harbour Jewfish. Hey, Cam, nice to have you on the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast, mate. Great to be talking about Sydney Jewfish. Thanks for having me on, Greg. Uh, Looking forward to sharing whatever I can with your listeners, mate. So cheers for that. Mate, I've been doing a bit of research and I've spent a bit of time on your Instagram profile. So I know you catch plenty of Jewfish. I had a look around. You've written a few articles about them as well. Now, one thing we're going to have to get straight, mate, I've taken a long time to switch over from calling them Mulloway to calling them Jewfish. You say you use those terms interchangeably, so I'm going to continue to call them Jewfish, and I think you should, for consistency, call them Mulloway, and that'll confuse everyone. (laughs) Yeah, it's one of the species I've got about a thousand names, it seems, so (laughs) trying my best to keep it consistent, but I can't guarantee you might see me slipping up there. (laughs) No, I must admit, I tend to use them interchangeably too. So listeners, Jewfish, Mulloway, for the purposes of this interview, exactly the same fish, don't get confused. And, you know, they do, as you say, have lots of other names as well. And some of them are not so, well, we probably couldn't run them during kids hour because they get a bit of a bad rap when they're not playing the game. Oh, definitely, mate. Yeah, <laughs> they're a frustrating species at the best of times, but very satisfying as well. So Absolutely. Well, anything that takes a bit of time and a bit of practice and a bit of hard work is always going to be more satisfying at the end of the day when you achieve it and you can consistently achieve it, which you seem to be able to do with Jewfish. So. We're looking forward to you putting us on the path to success ourselves. But before we get stuck into that, mate, let's just spend a bit of time getting to know you a bit better and understanding what makes Cam tick. So, mate, other than Jewfish, there's lots of other species in Sydney Harbour. What are the other species you like to throw lures at? Well, mate, the harbour's one of those places where there's quite a lot to target and it's a pretty healthy system regardless of it being located pretty much smack bang in the heart of the biggest city in Australia. I like to fish for kingfish seasonally in there. It's a great kingfish Mm. fishery. You'd probably see a lot of the photos online. It really seems to be thriving. That's kind of been sidelined, to be honest, for me chasing the mulloway because I just love to do that. But whenever I'm not targeting jewies in the harbour, you can pretty much guarantee I'll be chasing the kingfish and other pelagics for that matter. It's got a great pelagic fishery. There's a lot of bait in there seasonally and kingfish, salmon, bonito, all that sort of thing. Fantastic surface action. So. That's always, if I'm not charting the Mulloway, I'll be after some of those surface feeding pelagics. Sounds good, mate. Like you say, lots and lots of different opportunities there. So right on Sydney's doorstep, which is fantastic. Now, mate, if you could down tools, though, and you could take a bit of time off and you know, get a bit of R&R, just you and a fishing rod and nothing else, no phones or computers, and you had an unlimited budget to travel anywhere in Australia, where would you want to spend a week and why? To be honest, Greg, I've been to so many amazing places around Australia and I've certainly got so many more places I need to visit. But at the moment, with the fishing I do, it'd be really hard not to just take a week off and just spend it on the New South Wales coastline, toting Mulloway off the ocean rocks and beaches. That's sort of a passion of mine and I really don't get to do it much or as much as I'd like anymore working full time. So yeah, I'd love to just spend a week just doing that. It's something I really enjoy. So (laughs) you have to be that, weirdly enough. Well I have to say, mate, I think you're making a grave mistake by, you know, letting work get in the way of fishing, but I understand that we we all have to do that sometimes. But definitely there's some great Mulloway Jewfish all up and down the New South Wales coast. Would you go north or would you go south of Sydney if you had to choose one? Oh that's a good question. It'd probably (laughs) have to be north, Greg. There's Cracking fishing north or south of Sydney, funnily enough, for that type of fishing, Sydney is not very good. So I can't do it locally. Pretty much anywhere would do, but yeah, have to choose the north coast. There's some awesome areas on the far north coast in particular I'd love to explore a little bit further. So yeah, it'd have to be north, I'd say. All right, excellent. Now, apart from dewfish, yeah, there's lots of other species that you might want to target. What's one that's on your bucket list, mate? In fact, what's the one that's right at the top of your bucket list that you'd like to tick off before you kick off? Oh, that's a hard one, Greg, because Jewfish is, I would have to say, my major goal at the moment would be a 150 centimetre Jewfish. But in saying that, if I had to pick one species, I have locally, we do have a lot of kingfish. And as I was saying, I do like to, to chase 
the kingfish when I'm not fishing for Mulloway. And I haven't really got to target those really big ones yet, especially on top water. So I'd love to crack a big king off the top. Uh, maybe something around that 20 kilo mark would be amazing. I'd definitely love to go over to New Zealand and try and even eclipse that mark one day. And off the rocks would be even better, mate. So. Yep, yep. Mate, I love that. And, you know, usually when I ask that question, people have got this amazing fish in an exotic location they want to go after. When I can tell that I've got somebody who's absolutely obsessed and dedicated and no doubt is the right choice for the show is when they say they want to fish for the species that they're actually on the show to talk about. So, yeah, you, you can fish for jewfish any time, but if you had the opportunity to fish for any species, you'd fish for jewfish. Well, that's yeah, that, that's a match made in heaven as far as I'm concerned as a podcast interviewer because it means that you're really, really fixated and focused on that particular species. You're obviously putting a lot of effort into figuring out how to fish it, and that's going to help a lot of our listeners who might want to fish for that species as well. So, how close have you come to that magic 1.5 meter mark? Oh, look, my PB at the moment is just over 140, so I'm, right. I'm getting there. You're not, um, you're not too far yeah. off. You just need a brag mat that's just been shrunk down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, something along those lines. Yeah. And was that a lure caught fish? Yeah, a lure caught fish was actually very early in my Mulloway fishing career. A bit of luck involved on that one. <laughs> But hence the obsession with Jewfish now, I suspect. Definitely, mate. That one really ignited my passion for the species. <laughs> and definitely hasn't died in the slightest since then. It's only grown. So. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Now, mate, if we were to have a bit of a rummage for your tackle box or a rummage for your boat, what's something we might find there that might come as a surprise to the average angler? Oh, look, it's pretty stock stand in my tackle box. But one thing that people kind of look at it and think what's going on here is probably I do scatter rice throughout a lot of my Mm. uh, tackle trays, anything that kind of contains metal, which I guess is pretty much everything in fishing, especially my juke heads. It is nice just to put a bit of rice in amongst those. It does absorb the moisture I've found. Mm. And I thought it might have been a bit of an urban myth, but since I started doing it, it does seem to accumulate a lot less rust on those terminal tackles. So, yeah, rice seems to work for me, and it's certainly in a few of my tackle boxes, so. Yep, it absolutely does work. And if you're a cheapskate like some of my mates, every now and then you'll empty the rice out of your tackle box, you'll stick it in the oven for an hour or so and dry it out and start again because you're too cheap to go buy a dollar bag of rice from the supermarket. So It hasn't reached that stage yet for me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we go. <laughs> well, let's hope if it doesn't, mate, because there's no hope for those guys. But let's have a chat about your favourite piece of fishing tech, mate, or your favourite fishing gadget. What have you got for us in that department? Oh, look, it would have to be an electric motor, I would say. Mm. I know sound is a very popular, and I'm sure a lot of people would say sound are, but I have found for a lot of my fishing I like to do. Over time, you can kind of get a hang from the bottom just by fishing naturally and the things that you encounter and the time it takes to sink down. But when it comes to dealing with wind on your coastal trees and things like that, having an electric motor with spot lock on it, in my opinion, it's absolutely invaluable. It's okay. very thing to, to own. So it'd have to be an electric for me. Yeah. So commonly when I ask that question, you know, the most common things that come up are the electric motor and or the sounder. And I must admit, I was expecting you to say it to be the sounder. So you reckon you can find fish without a sounder, but it's hard to target them without being able to stay on point. Yeah. Look, it's... In saying that, I have fished a lot with the sounder, so I'm probably coming from a place where I know the bottom of the estuary where I fish quite well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I thought it might be a different answer, but for me, yeah, it'd be the electric at this stage. Yeah. Well, fortunately, mate, we live in a world where we are actually allowed to have both, and uh, and so I'm not going to tell anyone that they can't have both a sounder and electric motor and whatever other marine electronics they want in their boat. I reckon if you if you can get them and you can use them, you should go for it. So. Let's have a talk about who you'd like to spend some time fishing with, mate. So if you had 24 hours to fish with absolutely anybody in the world, who would you like to take out for a fish and where would you like to take them? And this could be somebody who's alive and well. It could be somebody who's no longer with us, but yeah, obviously somebody you'd like to spend a bit of time on the water with. Oh, look, mate, there's so many cracking anglers out there, especially in the Jewfish field I could learn a lot from. But mm. at the end of the day, it would have to be my late granddad or pop, as I called him. We did have a lot of fishing trips teed up towards the end of his life but unfortunately he was taken before his time from illness so yeah a lot of those trips didn't get to happen so I just loved to take him knowing what I know now which I didn't know back then 
anywhere really on the water tiding the dew fish. He always just loved to see me catch any fish, so I'm sure he'd love to get a few mull away. So, yeah, that'd be great. Sydney Harbour would be a great spot. Hawkesbury, I've, the place wouldn't matter too much to me. Just spending that, that time would be great. Yeah, good stuff. All right, mate, last of these getting to know you questions, and you may have already answered this one in passing earlier on. It's about your most memorable dewfish capture on a lure. So tell us that story, mate, and make us feel like we're actually watching the whole thing unfold. I'll try my best, Greg, but yeah, <laughs> look, it would have to be that PB capture. Any big mull away, it's burned in your memory forever. You're not going to forget it, but that PB, yeah, look, it was a nice stormy Monday afternoon. I was walking home from school at the time, so I was quite young. I hadn't really caught too many dew and lures. I'd probably say it'd be something around the 10 sort of range. So I was very keen but didn't have much knowledge and I'd been sussing out a location very close to home and one that I've actually learned over the years isn't very productive. Mm. So I was very lucky with this one and it was pouring down rain, horrible weather, but for some reason I just walked down to the location because it is very close to my house and I was sitting there and the rain was driving away, rain howling wind and, you know, the wind was pushing the rain sideways and I was sitting there huddling behind a tree just thinking, what am I doing here? But all of a sudden the sun just came out. It's almost like a little, a miracle almost. The sun came out, <laughs> the wind stopped and I popped a cast out and yeah, I couldn't believe it. Came tight pretty quick into the session and I was on, I think it was 15 pound braid and 16 pound leader. I was just lamb based with typical dew flicking tackle, three mm. to six kilo rod. And yeah, the fight, the fight that this dish took me on, it was incredible it stripped probably 100 plus meters of line in the blink of an eye and i could see my backing mono starting to appear <laughs> it was a probably went time. a bit too hard on it mate and <laughs> i wouldn't have gone that hard now knowing what i do but you know for some reason or another i've lost so many fish since then going too hard on them but mm. it all just held together it was a long fight i don't know how long it went for it's sort of a blur when you look back of it of, of adrenaline but eventually yeah that big silver flank materialised from the depths and managed to beach what would still be my PB today of 140 centimetres. So, yeah, I'll never forget that, Greg. That was an epic moment in my fishing history and hopefully I can top that someday soon. Great story, mate. And I tell you what, you did a brilliant job of telling it as well. So usually when I ask people to take us there and make us feel like we're part of it, they struggle a little bit. You did it in great style, mate. I reckon it's the best job I've heard so far on the show. So well done on that. Yeah. Now, mate, what we're going to do now, though, is start pulling together some of that information that's going to help our listeners who might be interested in targeting some dewfish, aka Mulloway, in Sydney Harbour themselves. So we're going to get into that part of the interview where we start sharing those tips. And I'm going to get you to start by telling us about something that you've learned after all this time and all this effort and all this focus that you've put into targeting dewfish on lures in Sydney Harbour. Tell us something that you've learned that maybe the average angler wouldn't know, but definitely needs to know if you are their target. Okay, yeah, there's probably a couple of things I would say. But the first of them is they're in pretty good numbers. A lot of people, when they think dewfish, they do think um, they're very thin on the ground and quite difficult to come across. But in the harbour, they're actually in very good numbers. And I think that's got a lot to do with the fact that commercial fishing is currently banned from the harbour. and. Mm just due to pollution reasons and also recreational fishers don't really keep many mull away for the same reasons. There seems to be a very healthy local population of fish in the harbour and it's definitely viable to go out there and expect to catch fish. And if you're lucky, catching double figures in a session is certainly not out of question there. Wow. So it's a very healthy yep. Yep. fishery. I just think they're a bit more focused in where they sit compared to other species. So your bread and butter fish, like your brim whiting, flathead, that sort of thing. They tend to be spread pretty much everywhere throughout the estuary, but the Mulloway, they just tend to be a bit more focused. So when you don't really know where they sit and don't know how to identify those locations, it can really feel like you're chasing a needle in the haystack. Once you learn where they sit, it's definitely half the battle and it can be quite amazing just how many there are in the harbour, that's for sure. Well, that is absolutely awesome news and not what I would have expected for a fishery and a waterway that's on, as you say, the doorstep of Australia's largest city. So that's fantastic news. And I think you know, one of the things about this particular species is if you think about some of the bread and butter species, you know, the brim, the flathead, the whiting, those sorts of things, you can probably catch them accidentally if you're out just targeting whatever comes along, as a lot of weekend anglers do. But I don't think that happens all that often when you're targeting dewfish. And even if you know, you're fishing for them with bait, yeah, occasionally they'll just turn up for the guy who's bought a packet of prawns at the servo and slung, slung a prawn out into the harbour. 
But generally, they only turn up for those people that go seriously looking for them and targeting them. And I think that's one of the reasons, possibly, that they're probably also a little bit more prevalent in Sydney Harbour than you might expect. Yeah, definitely. Look, if you don't know where they sit and you're just kind of going out there for a fleek, you might find it very difficult to come across them. But as I was saying, it, su- it surprises me to this day how prevalent they are in the harbour. And it just, to be honest, year on year, it does seem to be improving that might just be a result of me fishing it more and more and knowing it a little bit more each year but the results do seem to be quite consistent and maybe even improving greg so it's promising signs i guess for the Mm. years ahead Mm. anecdotally at least it is difficult isn't it to know whether your skills are just sort of creeping up and leveling up bit by bit and so you're starting to see the benefits of that or whether you know the fishery is actually improving as well or maybe it's both But certainly, I think as you fish more and more for a species and you develop that confidence and that sort of sixth sense about where they're going to be and how they're going to be behaving, your fishing just naturally improves. And it may not be something that's a conscious thing. It may just be a a matter of time on the water and you're just becoming accustomed to doing things you're not even really thinking about anymore. They've become second nature. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Now, mate, you've segued beautifully in that previous question into what I'd like to ask you next. You said that There's lots of fish there, but you have to know where they're sitting. So help us to figure out where they're sitting, mate. For someone who's heading out onto Sydney Harbour for the first time in search of jewfish, what should they be looking for in terms of structure? Where are the fish going to be? And particularly over these next few months, because these are fish that can use all parts of the system. I mean, they can, they'll go out to sea, they'll, they'll be in the reefs out off Sydney as well. You know, or they'll go right up into the freshwater at times too. So they can use all parts of the estuary system, all parts of the harbour, Over the next few months, where should we start looking for them in terms of the types of structure? Yeah, look, great question, Greg. They're definitely a universal fish for where they sit in the estuary. And times of year is not quite as relevant as you might think. Okay. But in saying that, over summer, as a general rule, and this is a very general rule because I go out all the time and I find examples that just totally disprove this. But in the summer, I would be starting closer to your river mouth, further down. Um, and over as the year progresses, I would start to move upriver. I really stress it's a general rule, but that's kind of the location wise where I'd start. The structure specifically, there's so much different types of structure in the harbour. But I guess at the end of the day, you could probably narrow it down into two different categories. Mm. And that would probably be your rocky structure, which would be your steeply sloping rock walls and also your reefs, which sit in deeper water. Those spots generally seem to hold the bigger class of fish I've found. And there's also the what I call open water fishing. So Sydney Harbour, it's got a quite a unique fishery that I've found anyway, in that there's so many mulloway that sit in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, <laughs> but what it seems, it's not uncommon to be fishing in the middle of the river. So you've got your open water, and that's generally centred around, there's a lot of deep water in the harbour, a lot of mm. deep holes, very deep system. So these holes are generally 20 metres plus. And I found that those holes in particular, they don't necessarily fish too well, but the shallow periphery of those holes, the margins of those holes, are great places to fish. They're generally 8 to 15 metres deep, Mm. quite flat and barren in nature, but there's a lot of transient fish coming through those zones and feeding on the bait that accumulates there. So very open water fishing, and that's very productive for your smaller fish, but they do school there in very big numbers. So. Two okay. very different types of fishing pretty much covers most of what I do in the harbour. So do the fish move from those habitats during the year or are those habitats pretty consistent right through the year? They are very consistent. Okay. I guess I'll just combine that with the the rule with the Mulloway being closer to the mouth in summer and further up river in winter. You can find those both of those habitats everywhere throughout the harbour. That might be Middle Harbour, that might be Parramatta River, might be Port Jackson, which is the main body. And you've also got your Lanco River as well. And they do have all those rivers and locations mentioned all have that structure in common. So just time of year would be one thing to consider, I'd say. All right. So finding fish in those big open areas, is it just a case of motoring around, watching the side scan, trying to find signs of fish or looking for bait or casting under the schools of feeding pelagics or how does that work, mate? What's the best way to find fish in those open? I mean, there's obviously if you're fishing the rock walls and headlands, there's plenty of structure there. You know where to go to, but in those open areas, they could be anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, that's pretty much all the things you just mentioned there, Greg, and more is what I would use to identify these locations. So a lot of the time, you're just looking for those shallower margins 
And obviously there's a lot of shallow margins around deep holes in the harbour. That's very broad and not too helpful, I guess. But what you're looking for, you can cover a lot of these locations in a day and you're looking for locations, obviously one that hold a lot of bait. These spots, it does fluctuate. So it pays to cover a lot of ground and just keep your eyes out and use your sounder. Look for bait underwater, but also obviously, as I said, there's a lot of pelagic activity in the harbour. So you can definitely locate the bait by eye as well and sound around underneath and the mulloway often aren't too far behind. The best sort of open water spots also tend to have some sort of structure. Mostly in the harbour, it's just barren sand bottom. But some areas, they do have cockle beds, I guess I call them. So they're areas of cockle that are quite densely grown together on the bottom. And you can locate those with your sounder. If you put it on the sonar mode, not the structure scan mode, mm. they're generally sharp, slightly lumpy bottom and a bit redder in colour. I think with the red, you get a harder bottom. You get a better, a redder sort of return on yep. most traditional sonar. Yep. That's a good way to locate the cockles and you pick them up with your vibe lures as well. And I guess there's a whole ecosystem that is created by those cockles. You'll get your small prawns and mantis shrimp, but a couple of things that are quite common in the harbour and obviously all the different fish that feed on them. And then in turn, the Mulloway, the apex predator, which feed on everything that's there. So finding those cockle beds on those open water flats and combine that with a bit of bait that's hanging, white bait, things such as that, and you've definitely got a winning combo there. All right. You couldn't have given us much better detail than that, mate. That's fantastic. So, And just to reiterate, you're saying down closer to the mouth, the seaward end of the system during the summer months, and then during the winter months move up. You're still looking for those deeper holes. You're looking for the margins of those deeper holes you're looking for cockle beds and any sign of bait or feeding pelagic fish they're all a good indication of places where there might be a jewfish so that's fantastic all right so let's talk about bite windows mate this is going to get interesting because i know you know when you talk to jury specialists you know they've always got lots of theories lots of people have theories about lunar cycles lots of people have theories about you know when there's fresh water coming down or weather conditions or barometric pressures tides all that kind of stuff mate I want to hear your theories. I want to hear what you've learned over the years you've been targeting this species so that we can start to piece that puzzle together a little bit. Oh, so it's a good question, Greg. And honestly, there's so many theories out there. And <laughs> I think over the years, it is becoming more well known and widely accepted, I guess, that you can pretty much throw all those theories out the window when yep. it comes to mudway fishing. They are a fast-growing fish. They feed ravenously and they've got a very fast metabolism to back that up. So they need to feed constantly to fuel their growth rate. And I've certainly found that reflects in the sort of locations and conditions that I catch them in. I've certainly caught them in pretty much any combination of moon, tide, time of year, barometer, you name it. It doesn't really seem to matter, but in saying that, when you're first starting, definitely get out there, fish as many different conditions as possible. You'll surprise yourself at just how many different sets of conditions they're catchable in, but you will notice that certain locations do tend to fish a bit better on certain conditions, and that's generally a result of things like your bottom structure and underwater topography. Like, for example, you might have a rocky point that you notice eddies quite well on the run-out tide, and it might hold a lot of bait as, as a result in the Mulloway they won't be far behind. So things like that are worth noting. And if you have a heap of spots that you've worked out fish well in different conditions, you can eventually, no matter what sort of conditions you're thrown at with the day you've got off and you're spending on the water, you can get out and sort of fish those each of those spots in the peak bite windows. And that seems to work pretty well for me in the harbour. But yeah, don't pay much attention to conditions. So. I love all of that because I think a lot of people, yeah, there, there are definitely some times and some species where as you say, there might be a particular set of conditions or circumstances that work better at a particular spot. As you say, it might be a reef that fishes well on the run out because there's a good hole behind it and the fish are waiting there for stuff to come down or sitting on the pressure point at the front of a river. Or, you know, there's certainly, for a lot of species, there's, some, you know, there's a set of conditions that will work well at a particular location. But if you look at other locations, then different conditions can work. So, And I found this extensively when I was researching, when I first moved to, to Brisbane, I was researching where to fish for snapper on Morton Bay and I had experts who were very, very accomplished snapper fishermen saying, oh, you've got to fish on the run-in tide and others saying you've got to fish the run-out tide and then you get someone to say, oh, the full moon doesn't fish well and others will say, I only fish the full moon and when you start piecing it all together, you realise that each of these guys has a little patch of the 
the system that they figured out how to fish on their particular set of conditions. And if they were to fish other, other areas a little bit differently when the conditions are different, they might find that they open up a whole new range of fishing opportunities. But you can become very fixated on those conditions and not go out and look. Even if you go out and the fishing's slow, it's still better than staying home. So get out there and give it a go. So love Absolutely. everything you said there, mate. One thing I would like to touch on, though, that you know it's a classic one for dewies is the flow of fresh water when you get a big rainfall event and you know that doesn't happen as often during the summer months so it's probably not it's probably less likely to happen over the the next few months in sydney but how does it affect them in sydney harbour when you get a big fresh come down yeah it's a another great question greg so it definitely does affect them very heavily you'll get Hmm. a lot of fish regardless of the time of year spread throughout the estuaries you might get, as I mentioned, you'll have your bulk of fish that will be located downriver in the summer. However, that rain will definitely flush fish and bait out of the upper reaches. And that's when your lower harbour fishes exceptionally well. Mm. So Mm. if you can fish that deep water where obviously you've got that denser salt water sitting on the bottom, uh, which is favourable to the fish, that's a great thing to do when it's fresh. So I like to fish downriver and I like to also fish deeper after fresh. and just by targeting those similar structures that I mentioned earlier in those same conditions with an emphasis on the deeper water definitely can have some very good results at downriver. So. Mm, mm. Yeah, great stuff. And it's the only thing that I guess I've found consistently across the board, no matter where you fish, seems to induce a bit of a dewfish bite and help you to locate where they're going to be and get some, you know, hunt a little bit more and get some more aggressive is that fresh coming down. It seems to be the only universal thing that everybody agrees on. So sounds like it's also the case in Sydney Harbour. So let's move on to tackle, mate. So in terms of the basic rod and reel combo, line and leader as well, what should we have in our hands when we, you know, sort of head into Sydney Harbour with dewfish in mind? Look, you can certainly do it all with, one outfit. I like to take a, a few on the water, but I would probably break that down into the two different types of structure that I mentioned. So the Yoroki structure, I would generally fish a little bit heavier than probably what is conventional for estuary dew fishing. I like to fish 20 pound braid with 40 pound leader. I will go 30 or 50. And I found that Mulloway won't necessarily look to bust you off a lot of the time but they will inadvertently bust you off. And some of that gnarly or rocky structure, definitely I've had a few painful losses in the harbour over the years on the lighter gear. So I have stepped it up to that heavier gear and thicker leaders and lines. And I have found that to result in a lot more fish landed. So that's working for me. I haven't found the heavier leader to deter the bite at all. You'll catch plenty on that. So yeah, I would use that heavier gear for the rocky structure. And then for the open water, well, obviously that's on the total different end of the spectrum. I would use the lightest gear I pretty much can get away with and just have fun on those open water fish because there's not much they can bust you off on. I do like to use 10-pound braid typically. You can certainly go a lot lighter. I use 20-pound leader. Again, you can go lighter, but there's a lot of big flathead. You'll catch as bycatch, which if you use the lighter gear, they'll eventually scuff at your leader and it's constant retying and shortening of your leader. So I use the 20 pound and you also get a lot of kings as I mentioned and they're a different species to my way. They'll, uh, they'll certainly tear you up on pretty much any structure available. Um, if there's anything there, they'll find it. So those two things, I do like to fish a slightly heavier leader. Rod and reel wise for the rocky structure, I would put those lines mentioned on a 4,000 sort of reel, four to 3,000 size. And then rod-wise, probably a four to eight kilo rod. There's a lot of different ratings on the market out there, but something that's just capable of throwing around a heavier jig head. On the open water, it's just a two to five or three to six kilo rod. Then I'd pair that with a 2,500 size reel, uh, put it on the braids mentioned earlier, and does it for me, Greg. Yeah, sounds good. So two outfits, that makes perfect sense. And as you say, they're not a species that's going to go diving into reef, but what they can do is take a lot of line out very quickly. And if you've got 100 metres of line out, and there's oyster beds and rocks and all kinds of hard structure between you and the fish, all that line has to do is touch one of those bits of structure and it's all over Red Rover. So having that heavier gear to be able to put the brakes on a little bit makes perfect sense to me in that deeper water around those you know, hard structures. So Cam, let's talk about lures. And I know I lectured you before we hit the record button and started talking about, I'm going to keep you, you know, restrict you to three lures and all that kind of thing. But now I'm actually reflecting back and thinking maybe that was a little bit harsh because you've got two different types of structure here, mate. So 
Perhaps I'll give you an extra lure or two because we, you're probably going to use different lures depending on whether you're fishing around the periphery of those deeper holes or whether you're going to be fishing those hard structures. So maybe I'll give you four or even five lures, mate. How's that sound? Very kind of you, mate. And yeah, I'm <laughs> hoping to try and sneak a one or two extra in any way there. So you've uh, <laughs> only my paws, I think, so, Greg. So, so you the trouble. All right. So, mate, let's start with those deeper water structures first. So tell us about the first lure that you'd have to have in your box. And we're going to focus on that period as I said, over the next few months, so we're looking at kind of February, March, April, you know, we, we're well into January now. Over that period, what are the lures that you would have to have for fishing that hard structure around the rock walls and headlands? So, yeah, the rock walls would certainly be my number one plastic would be a five-inch Z-Man diesel minnows, and I would mm. pop that on a TT headlocks jig head. And being deeper water, and I'm using that heavier braid as well, I do like to use fairly heavy jig heads. Mm. A 5 eighths is a great starting point, and I use that in a 7 o typically for that 5-inch Z-Man. Colour doesn't really matter. I just kind of look at the water colour and try and find something that contrasts well that the Mulloway can find easily. And, yeah, that sort of lure does seem to work quite well in that situation. You're targeting those bigger fish around the rocky structure, so that 5-inch lure, it's a little bit bigger than a lot of it, lures that get thrown around down here but they do tend to elicit those bites from those slightly larger than average fish. And yeah, look, the material of the Z-Man is actually positively buoyant. And you've also got factors like the paddle tail on that one. So all those things do help to slow down the descent of your lure, mm. regardless of the jig heads. You do need to bump up your jig head weight to counter those things. And also, yeah, the line drag created by that heavier line, you do need to bump up your jig head again to help eliminate that drag and just keep a tight or semi-tight line so you can detect those bites down in the deep water. So that would be my first lure of choice, Greg. Yeah, excellent. And the snake locks jig heads, of course, give you a little bit of flexibility. They help with keeping things a little bit snag resistant, I guess. Are you rigging these lures weedless or are you fishing them with an exposed barb? Oh, for me, look, it'd be actually the head locks jig head is probably the main one to use. So I don't worry too much about weedless. I have experimented with weedless and the Mulloway they do seem to hook up pretty well they do crunch down hard but I do find if you let the lure hit the bottom and quickly whip it up just as it touches down you don't get too many snags so yeah I like to fish just that standard uh, TT lures headlocks which is pretty popular it's pretty standard you get around the straights fairly thick gauge so yeah it does help when you're pulling hard around that structure so yep yep okay so you've given us a bit of a hint about how you work the lure you said you whip it up you let it get down you whip it up don't let it sit on the bottom for too long. Are you fishing these lures around, you know, sort of areas where there's a bit of water movement rather than areas where it's fairly still? Yeah, definitely. Look, there's a whole host of different locations I'll fish this lure. So a lot of the time in your deeper water, in your very deep rock walls, it'd be very difficult to fish those when the current's charging. So the deeper rock walls, it's nice to fish around that tide change. Yep. In saying that, it is nice to have a little bit of flow, which I... I find helps concentrate the Mulloway a little bit more. When Mm. there's no flow at all, they can be spread out and feeding basically anywhere in an area. So slightly before that tide change, just when there's a little trickle of flow still um, or slightly after the tide change, tends to be very productive for me. It still keeps sitting tight to the rock walls and it can be quite predictable where they sit when you look at the eddies. So, yeah, a little bit of flow tends to be good for me. And basically what I'm doing with the lure, very simple, I let it, descend down the face of the rock wall once it gets to the bottom you want to be using a semi-slack line wind as the current takes it to just keep the line tight but not fully tight if it's totally tight it can affect the action of the lure somewhat so it is nice to have a semi-tight line although on the paddle tail plastics it's not too important and yeah once it hits the bottom just pop the lure up retrieve honestly there's so many different retrieves out there it really doesn't matter just a couple of pops off the bottom will suffice. Get your rod up fairly high so the Mulloway can notice that lure. In saying that, when the current's charging, it can sometimes pay to do slightly smaller hops so that lure doesn't get lifted up and taken away by the current. So just key factor is get it to the bottom. As soon as it touches down, whip it up straight away. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with things like snags. The current will turn the lure on its side and then that hook will drag into the reef and it'll be all over. Yep. So, yep. yeah. Just get it to the bottom, hop it up, and pretty much do that back to the boat and repeat. It's fairly simple with those lures. I think even I could handle that, mate. (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, not be tricky. (laughs) So, Cam, let's talk about lure choice number two on those rock walls. So we've got the paddle tail, soft plastic. What have you got for lure number two? 
Oh, look, for the rock walls, I actually only generally fish one lure most of the time for the rock walls just because it is such a snaggy environment, and that's that five-inch diesel minnows. Most of the time, that does it for me okay. in the rock wall. Minnows. I will fish other lures occasionally, such as vibes, but they tend to be a little bit more effective in the open water situation away from the snags. So I'll probably discuss some of the other lures a bit more in detail relating to the open water but actually one lure that i do like to use a lot and it's not so much around the vertical rock walls that drop off but there's the other rocky structures like reefs which are located in pretty deep water port jackson has quite a few located in 20 plus meters of water Mm. Uh, middle harbour has got a lot of deep reefs located in very deep water Um, so the way i like to fish these is because there's often a bit of current and there can be wind working against you and other factors, and it is very hard to pop a lure precisely on the head of a mulloway that you've sounded up in that deep water. So I use a micro jig, and that's a really productive lure for me. And that micro jig, it, it does allow me to get down very quickly regardless of the conditions, and I'll typically fish one that's a 40 to 60 gram micro jig. Brands don't particularly matter. I've used a whole manner. They all work pretty well. That sort of rounder, sort of slow fall style jig seems to work well on the Mulloway, but they definitely aren't too fussy, I okay. would say. And in terms of hooks, do you just fish those straight out of the box with the trebles on them, or do you like to play around and put assist hooks on the top, or how do you set your micro jigs up? Yeah, good question. So I guess when you're hopping the jig on the bottom, if you're using a treble, it, the way the jig works is it turns on its side and kind of flutters back and forward, and the treble does tend to tangle a lot in that situation mm. so if they're not fitted with assist hooks i would definitely retrofit them okay and there are a lot of micro jigs that come from the japanese market that they're probably not designed to target fish that we target in australia and on the same pressures and tackles so do take note of the lighter thinner style assist that come on some of your jigs and definitely pays to to upgrade those because i did spread it out in, in the early days micro jigging Yep, very good. All right, mate, so that's two lures for the deeper water and the rocky structures. Let's move into those more open areas now, the you know, periphery of those deep holes with the cockle beds. And you've already told us that a vibe's going to be among the collection of lures you're going to talk about there. So is that your number one, or have you got something else you want to talk about first? Yeah, there's probably there's a few I use interchangeably. I guess the micro jig would be one of those. I'll okay. probably touch a bit more, but my top, my main ones I'll, I'll use would be any sort of bait fish pattern plastic. I like to use recently the Z-Man 4-inch um, jerk shads has been one that I've used a lot and had quite a bit of success in those open water areas. And there's a lot of bait that congregate around on the shallow margins of those holes and particularly white bait, anchovies, other slim profile bait fish, hardy heads. Um, they all school up in these locations quite densely. And I guess that four inch jerk shads does mimic the profile of those pretty effectively so Mm. i like to throw that around being a plastic it can be tricky to get it down fairly deep when you're playing around with current and other factors so i do like to fish quite heavy for a small lure like that i'd usually fish a half ounce in the three or four oh of the tt headlocks again and basically the aim of the game is when you're fishing that open water structure, there's not necessarily anything that's holding the jewfish in one place. So you will need to do long drifts and try and cover a lot of water and try and find those mulloway on the sounder or cover as much water as you can. And using a heavier jig head, if you're just sinking the lure down on a more conventional light jig head, you're missing a lot of water and uh, you might never get that lure in front of the fish's face. So yeah, I like to use a heavy head and just hop that fairly aggressively off the bottom, just being a heavier head definitely seems to get the attention of those mullow when they're quite fixated on that slender profile bait so that's been a good one for me mm. you may have said it and i may have just missed it but are you casting these lures out and fanning cast out or are you fishing them basically vertically beneath the drifting boat or is it does it depend on the amount of current at the time yeah look it's definitely a combination of all those things if i'm locating mullow on the sounder that's definitely something i'm going to investigate and try and drop it down relatively vertical Obviously, taking in mind your current, so don't be casting against the current because it will simply lift your lure off the bottom and you'll be presenting that lure well away from the fish. Cast ahead of the fish, up current of the fish, and let your lure drift down underneath the boat to those 
to shift sound it up and fishing vertically in this situation can be very productive for those open water mulloway. Otherwise, if you're not locating fish, especially if you're locating bait but not fish, fan out your cast, try and cover as much ground as possible. Use side scan. If you've got that on your unit, you can use that. Definitely isn't essential, but that's an option that you can use to locate those spread out fish. But yeah, fan your cast, but do a uh, visual and attention to your sounder if you have one and present that lure to the fish under the boat if that opportunity comes. So mm, mm, Excellent. All right, mate. So I think we've covered that one pretty well. So that's the was a four-inch jerk shed or five-inch jerk shed? Yeah, four-inch jerk shed. They definitely both work, but four-inch has been a standout for me. Okay. Let's move on to the lure choice number two, those open areas. It probably comes as no surprise, and I think a lot of your listeners are probably sick of hearing it, but... We all know a vibe works incredibly well. They've exploded onto the scene and specifically the soft vibes tend to, don't ask me why, but they tend to work a lot better than hard vibes. But yeah, look, the soft vibes are a great lure. In the same situation that I'd fish the jerk shads, I use a soft vibe. But the reason I would turn to a soft vibe over a jerk shad is just slightly deeper water. Those places that have water over, say, 12 metres, depending on the current, I like to use a soft vibe. And yeah, look, it does imitate herring and other bait fish that are quite prevalent in the harbour herring silver bitties jewfish eat all of those things and it mimics that pretty well i guess one thing to note in the harbour since you are covering a lot of ground when you're fishing these open water areas the jewfish can be pretty far spread sometimes and you want to cover a lot of water in order to find them when you're not catching fish so i like to use the 30 gram soft vibes okay brand too important but it is a little, little bit heavier than probably the more common ones for the mm. southern Mulloway fishing, but mm. that works really well for me, just keeping constant contact with the bottom, regardless of your current conditions. You can even cast it on a right angle to the current when it's not too strong and really fan your cast out and cover a lot of water. And the 30 gram allows you to do that. So it's a great searching tool when you're not on schools of Mulloway and you're kind of trying to suss out a spot as quickly as possible. A vibe is a great option for doing that in your open water spots. Yeah, good stuff. And folks, I know a lot of people have been to the Doc Lures website and they've downloaded the report I put together where I pulled together all the lures that would be recommended for a number of different species of which Jewfish were one. And I found those lures that kept coming up over and over again when I spoke to guests on the ALF podcast, like Cam, who are catching lots of quality Jew. And it'll come as no surprise to you that Vibes feature fairly highly in that list. And there's a few others as well. But I'm not going to tell you which brands. You're going to have to go over and check them out at doclures.com forward slash top. And that'll get you into that report. And you can go and have a look and see what lures other people are using because Cam's lures aren't included yet in this report, but they will be in the next version, obviously. But uh, it's quite interesting to see what vibes are coming up over and over again. There's quite a few of them. So, All right, mate. So we've got the four-inch jerk shed. We've got the 30-gram vibe. What else do we need for those open areas? I guess it's just sort of a, a retouch on what I said for the deep water. Okay. But it would be a micro jig again. Yep. I guess there's four different lures in total. A micro jig mm. again is great for those open water scenarios. And it's good for everything the vibe's good for. Slightly deeper water again than the vibe. Your 15 to 20 metres being a good option. And when the current's charging mid-tide, it can still be an effective time to target the Mulloway in certain locations, especially spots where you have eddies formed by river bends and, and things such as that, rocky points and other protrusions. It can be a good time to target Mulloway still mid-tides. So sometimes, especially in your bigger tides, your spring tides, um, it can be very difficult to present a lure down to those fish. You can see them on your sounder, but it can be quite tricky. They'd be moving with the tide, and by the time you've got a plastic or maybe even a vibe down, they might have moved on, or it's very difficult to deal with the current. So I'll use a micro jig on those open water locations. And, you know, you would expect it in that shallow water to fall quite rapidly and not be too appealing to the mulloway, but I really found it surprising how effective they are. I tried it initially as more of a novelty, and it's definitely found its place permanently in my arsenal for that sort of fishing. How are you fishing them, mate? You Again, with a drifting boat, you're talking about fishing that sort of mid-tide sort of range. So it's a period when you could have a bit of water flow. You're just drifting along and you know, lifting and hopping them up and down over the bottom, keeping them fairly close proximity to the bottom, or, or how do you fish them? So, yeah, when the current's quite strong and you have wind and other things working against you, your only option might be to fish them relatively vertically. But in the same way as a vibe, you're targeting fish that might be spread across a large area. So yeah. I do like to fan my cast out. 
And when you're doing a long cast with a vibe, and you can do a particularly long cast with a vibe compared to, um, sorry, a, a micro jig, I should say, you can do a very long cast of a micro jig compared to other lures. So you can cover an immense amount of water. And on that long cast, your line will create quite a lot of water resistance and pressure. And that does slow the descent of your jig down quite significantly. So don't be afraid to throw those jigs in that even the shallower water and cover a lot of ground with them. And I like to whip them. When you're doing a long cast, they will be quite a while away. So you need to keep in contact with them, whip them fairly constantly. You'll feel them hit the bottom. Don't worry about that. As long as you've got your line tight, you need to just let it hit the bottom. You'll feel your line go slack, whip it up as soon as it touches down to the bottom, fairly aggressively to get it moving off the bottom. And that does seem to work. And you can do a similar thing underneath the boat as well. Um, Both tactics seem to work pretty well in that slightly deeper, again, 15 to 20 metres typically, open water situation, especially Mm. mid-tide. Awesome stuff, mate. You have covered that absolutely beautifully. So some great detail there, some great information. I have to say a micro jig is probably not something I would have thought of as a Jewfish lure, so I uh, really appreciate that. I'm not sure it's, uh, it has come up, but I think once or twice, talking Jewfish off the rocks perhaps, but certainly blades and things have come up, but not micro jigs. So do appreciate that. I think they're one of the underrated lures that a lot of people overlook for some of the flasher, more expensive lures, and they can be very effective for a whole range of different species. So now Cam, I've got one final question for you, mate. It's going to be a bit of a tricky one for you as well. But before we get onto that one, let's just take a bit of time to give the guys at Tackle Tactics a bit of a shout out, because I know that you've been associated with those guys for a while. You've written a bunch of articles for them. So tell us a bit about what Tackle Tactics is all about and what they do for you. Look, yeah, TT, they import a whole host of great Australian brands and they do make their own uh, locally. So you've got your TT Lewis, Z-Man, Akuma, They've got Platypus on board now. There's quite a wide range of brands and they've been really great to me over the years. Um, They picked me up pretty early into my fishing journey. Don't ask me how long ago it was. It's probably approaching that six, seven years ago now. So, yeah, they really got behind me in that that early stage of fishing and they really helped me out. Um, Gareth and Justin from TT Lures, they're great blokes and they import some and, you know, produce some great products. So I'm really lucky enough to be out of fish of it and you know i have given them a bit of a plug today but honestly if they drop me tomorrow i'd be uh, fishing the same lures so they're they're great product and i'm pretty honored to be able to represent them so i'll cut that bit out mate. they might decide to drop you because they're going to get the same value anyway out of uh, (laughs) having you on board with without having yeah probably a good point there (laughs) i don't don't think guys at tt lures are, uh, are good guys and they'd never do that so uh, and you obviously look after them as well. And folks, you know, apart from obviously going to the show notes for this episode, which we'll talk about in just a minute, you know, Cam has written a bunch of articles as well, you know, largely on targeting G-fish around the Sydney area. Um, and they're all found on the TT Lures website. So if you zap over there, Tackle Tactics website, uh, you could just Google uh, Cam Cronin, C-R-O-N-I-N, uh, and Tackle Tactics, and you'll find those articles will come up and you'll find them immensely useful, along with, of course, the show notes from this episode, which you'll find at doclures.com. It'll be episode 322, so you can just scroll through the podcast list, or you can type Cronin, C-R-O-N-I-N, into the search bar. That'll bring up the show notes as well. Either way, you'll get the PDF that you can download, you'll get all the links to uh, the sponsors and, and the socials for Cam and all that kind of stuff. If you want to hit him up and ask a few questions. And of course, you can also download the MP3 from there as well if you'd like to have the audio stored away on your phone or whatever for a, for a long trip away and you don't want to stream it from online. So that's all there at doclures.com. Go and check it out. And of course, go and check out that Top Lures report as well and see what all our gurus around Australia are throwing at Jewfish all over the place. Lots of different lures on there, but a few that come up over and over again, and you might want to think about whether you get some of those for your box as well. So, Cam, we're going to start to bring this interview to a close now. It's been an absolute blast talking to you. You've shared a ton of great information. I've been able to sit back and just enjoy the conversation, mate. You've made it really easy for me because I haven't had to prompt you. You've been very willing with your information, and that's very refreshing. So do appreciate that. But, mate, the final question that we're going to finish off with is about those quiet days, and we all have them. And certainly when Jewfish are your target, you know, they can sometimes come more more often than with perhaps of other species are a little bit easier. But give us a couple of clues made about some things that we can try on those days when we reckon we're probably fishing in the right spot, we've over the right types of structure. We might even be able to see 
fish on the sounder that we reckon are Jewies, but we're just not able to get a bite, mate. So what are the things that we could try that might turn the tables in our favour and you know, turn a donut day around? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And there's, you know, when you're seeing all those things, you're seeing you on the sound, you've caught you there in those conditions at the right spot, right conditions. I would say, honestly, you being the fairly voracious predator that they are, they tend to let you know of their presence pretty quickly when you're in the right sort of spot and they don't shy away from your lure most of the time. But in saying that, you do have your slow days and you'll sometimes be marking out fish and looking at them and just thinking, what are you doing? And of course, like us, if we just had a meal or we're not hungry, we're not going to feed. Hmm. So it can be tricky to get a bite sometimes. And, you know, I would cycle through my lures to start with. I would try, change my boat position, maybe throw a lure at a different angle at the same structure, try and hit the dew from different locations, depending on how you're, you're, uh, you're fishing and what sort of spot you're fishing. But one big thing that I tend to do is I like to fish a lot of different spots for dewfish. I don't get too hung up on one particular location if it's not producing. If I'm seeing mulloway, especially on the sounder, and I can't get them to bite relatively quickly uh, within 15 to 20 minutes, I definitely don't shy away from you know marking those fish in your GPS or taking a mental note if you don't have a GPS and just going to fish a few other spots. It just might not be that window of the tide or particular condition where they're uh, actively feeding. So you can go and fish a few other spots, you know, in those same conditions, and you might end up catching fish in another spot mm. or finding mm. more fish or more active fish that feed actively. And don't be afraid to go back maybe an hour or two later in a slightly different condition and go and hit those fish again on a, as the conditions change. And you'll be surprised. A lot of the time the fish, that's all that it takes, and they will come on the tube with the onset of new conditions. So, yeah, don't get too fixated on the one set of fish, I would say. Feel free to move around, try different locations and come back and yeah, you'll be surprised. A lot of the time those fish will feed when something's changed in their favour. And as you've already said to us, mate, there's plenty of dew fish in Sydney Harbour. They're not scarce. So if you're not having any luck with one lot, go and try another lot. Another thing a lot of people don't realise is that fish actually do sleep. Like every animal, they do have downtime. They might not be able to close their eyes like other animals, but they do go to sleep. And so sometimes you might see fish on your sounder particularly if they're hugging the bottom and there's no sort of movement happening, they may well be resting up. And if you come back an hour or two later, they may have had a bit of a kip and might be a little bit more active and ready to feed. So definitely worth trying that moving around tactic. So really appreciate that. Now, mate, it has been absolutely brilliant. This is a masterclass in Sydney Harbour Jewfish. I really appreciate all of that. So I want to thank you for coming along today. I want to thank you for being so free and willing to share what you know with our listeners and look forward to seeing you out on the water sometime. Definitely, Greg. Look, it's been great to chat with you. And like I said, it's such an easy conversation. I love my dew fishing, so more than happy to chat about them and yeah, answer any questions that people might have. And hopefully someone can listen to this and fingers crossed to uh, catch a few more dew fish as a result. So yeah, it's been great to be on the show and more than happy to have shared. So thanks, Greg. Don't miss a single episode of ALF. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes or jump on the DocLewis.com website for downloads and show notes. Till the next episode, Tidelines. Lines.